we can start. Thank you. Welcome to everybody. This is uh, a new edition of the Shama Lectures. The Shama Lectures uh, are by now a tradition of, at CISA. And despite of being a tradition, every year is uh, happening in the sense of a, an event, an important event, because of the subject, the important subject that are covered, and the quality of our speakers. And so we are very happy that this tradition will continue, continues, and will continue in the future. Uh, I will leave uh, the honor to introduce our speaker today to Professor Stefano Liberati, who is... Uh, the coordinator of the PhD in Astroparticle, and certainly much more com competent than me to, to describe uh, the speaker and the subject of the today's show lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the ninth uh, Dennis William Shama Memorial Lecture. Um, as usual, uh, this is an important meeting for us to remember uh, Dennis and his legacy of what he has done, especially in CISA, where he was uh, um, uh, the coordinator of the astrophysics sector from 1982 to 1998. Uh, Dennis Shama is remembered uh, for his uh, great legacy in the sense that uh, he had a stream of uh, uh, students, uh, uh, PhD students, that have uh, um, brought uh, really um, remarkable results in science uh, um, and many of them had a, had a lasting influence in astrophysics, in cosmology and gravitation theory. Um, some of them uh, remarkably went on to give uh, very important contribution in fields that were very different from the one in which they uh, set up their PhD and this is the case of uh, today's speaker, Professor Timothy Palmer from uh, Oxford University. Um, I would say that, uh, as usual, uh, it's difficult to as explain why Shama was so successful, uh, uh, not only in science, but only in producing such a remarkable stream of students, um, citing a few, there is George Ellis, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, Martin Rees, Brandon Carter, Bainé, Barrow, um, and many other names which are really relevant to, to science. Um, I would say that the Dennis was always able you know, to set up students on the right uh, project for them and then you, you basically you had to be able to uh, float on your own but uh, it's true that he was also able to always uh, create a network of connection of putting the right people in contact with the students and uh, n understand which was needed for uh, uh, the outcome, for a successful outcome of the PhD. Um, Today is really great to have uh, a talk from, uh, from Tim. He is uh, a very uh, relevant figure in uh, climatology and uh, he, his uh, research has spanned on a wide variety of subjects, um, in particular in issues related to the predictability and the dynamics of weather and climate. Um, for example, he has been among the first to uh, propose to recast the basic equation for climate prediction as a stochastic equation rather than deterministic. And uh, on a more practical side, he had also worked on the application of weather and climate forecast uh, for malaria prediction, for example, for flu flood uh, forecasting and crop yielding estimation. Um, he is currently president of the UK Royal Meteorological Society and is serving on the UK Government Office of Science as a, an expert in the panel. Um, in particular, looking at how science can help mitigate the humanitarian impact of natural disasters, something that, unfortunately, nowadays is very actual for what just happened in Oklahoma. Um, he's, um, um, he also ser um, uh, serves at the UK Meteorological Office uh, as a scientific in the Scientific Advisory Committee and is a consultant of the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast. Well, he has won uh, prizes from a number of uh, learned societies and academies uh, in the UK and elsewhere. And he is author of an impressive uh, number of research papers on a wide range of topics. 
So, well, I think that uh, this is enough for introducing Tim, and uh, we are really, all, I think, all anxious to hear this talk that uh, will span uh, from uh, Lawrence Gödel, Perros, basically going from uh, climate change to the final destiny of, uh, or what it may be, quantum mechanics. So, it's really a long journey that we are going to endure. So, and it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Timothy Palmer. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano, and uh, thank you to all of you for coming this afternoon. Um, so I, I was indeed um, a student of Dennis's back in the 1970s, seems like an awfully long time ago now, um, and my thesis was actually on um, uh, gravitational energy, mom energy momentum in generic space times, and I studied some, I think, of the first quasi-local expressions for gravitational energy momentum. But I, I moved away from the subject, and uh, Stefano says the last, um, whatever, 35 years or so has been very much in terms of, uh, of climate. And that's very much brought me into contact with uh, people like Ed Lorentz, who was the first uh, protagonist in my, the title of my talk, uh, Ed Lorentz, father of, of chaos theory. And so topics like you know, nonlinear dynamics, um, chaotic uh, uh, variability, fractal attractors, this sort of thing has become very much, I, I guess, second nature to, to, to me in my, in my research uh, in the last few decades. Um, and what I want to do today um, in this Dennis Sharma, I was sort of delighted to uh, have the opportunity to, to give the Dennis Sharma lecture because Dennis certainly propelled me uh, on my scientific career and, uh, you know, as I'll say, Dennis was an enormously inspirational scientist and got me excited about science. So what I want to do today is, is actually focus, I mean, I gave a talk uh, this morning at the uh, International Centre for Theoretical Physics on my mainstream climate research, so... Um, if you missed that, uh, uh, well, I'd be happy to return maybe sometime to CISA and give a climate talk. That, that would be nice, maybe sometime. But what I want to do today is a little bit different. I want to, um, I want to discuss some of these issues that were really... Uh, well, uh, they were at the forefront today. Uh, they were certainly at the forefront when I was doing a PhD. Issues to do with the marriage of general relativity and quantum mechanics, to do with the large-scale structure of the universe and to do with, you know, things like how, what is quantum mechanics about? How do we understand quantum mechanics? These are things which Dennis was, was passionately interested in. And what I want to do is kind of approach this subject with the hindsight of 30 years in nonlinear dynamics, chaos, chaos, and fractal attractors, and try to convince you that there actually is something new to bring to the table in these areas of fundamental physics. Um, uh, from a study of nonlinear dynamics. Uh, so I believe this quite passionately. Um, my talk uh, at ICTP this morning was actually trying to get climate modelers to think more stochastically about our climate system. In other words, to introduce explicit stochasticity into our climate models to represent some of the inherent uncertainties in, for example, how we numerically close the equations, the partial differential equations of climate. My talk this afternoon is going to be almost diametrically opposite because what I want to try to convince you is that um, we should actually be thinking more deterministically uh, in terms of fundamental physics. Um, and this is not, I hope, just a philosophical discussion. I think this will have some, uh, uh, some relevance uh, which will become apparent at the end of the lecture to these issues about the marriage of quantum mechanics and general relativity. I have some perspectives on this which I think are going to be certainly controversial and unusual, but they're, they're sort of driven, my, my way of thinking has been very much driven by the belief that we, we should actually be thinking uh, more deterministically about fundamental physics. All right, so that's my way of introduction. Um, if you're looking sceptical or feeling sceptical, uh, hold judgment uh, till the end of the lecture. So don't, don't walk out yet, please. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to start with Lorenz, um, somebody as I, I, I knew pretty well, unfortunately died uh, two or three years ago, but one of the, um, the father figures of, um, of, uh, of chaos theory. Um, his work was very much inspired by trying to understand the nature of the predictability of, uh, of our climate system, but you know, uh, scientists in, in many different uh, disciplines have found application of his ideas to, to theirs, whether it's in astronomy or uh, biology or economics, chemistry and so on and so forth. Um, at one level, the basic concept of chaos is very easily uh, illustrated. Um, we take this uh, set of differential equations uh, which, uh, which maps um, a state x, y and z, which just think of like as abstract uh, variables maps to the future and what we're going to do is look at two initial states which are almost identical but not quite and what we find is when we look at the evolution of these two states they track each other for a period of time and then uh, diverge and essentially become totally uh, decorrelated so this for example tells us that we cannot make uh, arbitrarily accurate weather forecasts uh, into the future because there will always be some uncertainty in our ability to measure the initial state. And as I say, this has had uh, uh, um, resonance in many different areas of science. And this is sometimes called the butterfly effect. Um, if I had some more time, I would actually tell you this is a very bad uh, phrase. Lorentz used the, butterfly, the, the phrase, the butterfly effect, to mean something completely different to low order chaos and that's an interesting topic in, in its own right but anyway for whatever reason the phrase the butterfly effect has, has kind of captured on captured, has been um, captured by the community to describe this sensitive dependence on initial conditions ok now you might say if you know your history um, was Lorentz really the first person to discover this effect what about Henri Poincaré some 50 years before Poincaré was studying the, uh, the three-body gravitational problem and he too realised some 50 years before Lorentz that this system also, its evolution was sensitive to the uh, initial conditions. So one question uh, which one might ask and I suspect this might have been one reason why Lorentz never won the Nobel Prize for example is well actually how new is Lorentz's insight? What I want to, um, what I want to, 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 to focus on is something which is a property of the Lorentz equations, not a property of the equations that, for example, Poincaré is studying. And that is the generation of a, an extraordinarily beautiful and remarkable geometry in the state space of these equations. So just imagine x, y and z as as defining three axes, not now physical space in X, Y and Z, but three different um, components of the dynamical system. So you specify a point in state, uh, you specify a, a, a Lorentz state by a point in this three-dimensional state space. And what Lorentz found was that as the equations evolve, no matter where you start in this state space, the system ultimately evolves onto some zero volume geometry something which you can show mathematically has no volume but it's some sort of geometry and the genius I think of Lorentz was to realise what this geometry was and it's something that he agonised about for, for a long time when he was writing his paper um, he realised you know, although this was, had zero volume it wasn't a point in state space because if it was just a point, that would mean the system was going to a steady state. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a periodic orbit. The title of his paper is, is, not, is, is deterministic non-periodic flow. So he realised he was dealing with a non-periodic uh, system which, which never repeated itself. So what was this geometry? And uh, just taking a bit from the paper, uh, he... he he sort of goes through a, a logical argument about what this geometry could be and this is a sentence from the paper we conclude there is an infinite complex of surfaces each extremely close to one or the other of two merging surfaces <coughs> he's basically slowly, gradually realising what he's looking at 
is what we now call a fractal, a very non-classical type of geometry. Um, so I, what I want to, uh, what I want to, the first part of my talk is to say uh, that the genius of Lorentz was making this link, the first link between differential equations, which after all are the lifeblood of physics. Pretty much, you know, all of us, whether we're doing classical physics or quantum mechanics, we deal with differential equations. Um, Lorentz made this remarkable uh, jump uh, between the differential equations and this fractal geometry. Uh, I realise I'm teetering on the verge of um, being in, a, being in a, a rock and roll band. I'm all too familiar with this concept of feedback, so I realise I'm teetering on the edge of feedback, so if the man in the control desk can turn the volume down a tiddly bit, that would be sort of useful. Just turn it down, because I'm just slightly feedbacking. Yep. Um, okay, so what I want to do is just spend a bit of time talking about some uh, remarkable properties of, of these fractal attractors, as they're called. I'm going to guess that nobody will know what I'm about to say, so, but I, there may be one or two, but this is, this, this is uh, something you don't normally see in the textbooks. In other words, what I want to do is make some links between this fractal geometry and some quite uh, deep areas of mathematics. So here's another picture, not it's a bit blurred, but a uh, picture of that geometry. Um, one of the things people look at um, are what are called unstable periodic orbits. So even though the attractor itself uh, is not periodic, in some sense embedded in the attractor are a whole class of, um, of, of orbits which actually do close on themselves. But they're very unstable. A tiny perturbation would, would take you off this periodic orbit and sort of onto the non-periodic attractor. Now, one question which mathematicians ask is how, do you, how would you classify these periodic orbits? And one way to do that is to use a technique called symbolic dynamics. Symbolic dynamics is kind of topological dynamics, so it, it's, a, it's a kind of giving you a qualitative feeling for the, the, the structures. And in symbolic dynamics, what we do, first of all, is partition, if you like, the attractor into two parts, a left-hand lobe and a right-hand lobe, so L and R, and then we describe these periodic orbits by uh, which parts of the phase space, or the state space or phase space, the periodic orbit passes through. So we can describe the periodic orbits by strings of, if you like, binary strings. So here's one, uh, which I think is possibly this one, which is, uh, starts on the left-hand lobe, goes to the right-hand lobe, goes back to the left, goes back to the right, goes back to the left, and then it repeats itself. So it goes round, it keeps going, stays on the left, one more oscillation, then right, left, right, left, left, so on. Periodic orbit. This turns out to be um, equivalent to what's called a trefoil knot. And in fact, one can study the, one can classify the periodic orbits both in terms of these symbolic strings and their knottedness using what's called Jones polynomial um, types of um, structures. Now, here's a little bit of mathematics, which if you, I, I realise this is, I believe, quite a general audience. So, just let it wash over you if you don't know exactly what I'm talking about. But there's a remarkable mathematical result which says that Lorenz knots are the same as modular knots. Now, I'm not going to tell you what a modular knot is exactly, except to say it's related to a mathematical structure called the modular group. And the modular group is essentially a, a group formed by two by two matrices with integer components and with unit determinants. So if you know what these things mean, that's fine. If you don't, just let it wash over you, it doesn't matter. And for any element of the modular group, such as this one, you can write that as a string. Now, these, this string, here the L and the R, are not the Lorentz uh, structures, but they're just simple matrices. So any element of the, period of the modular group can be written in this string form. And what Sir Geese showed was that these strings are identical to the Lorentz strings of periodic orbits. This is not a, a trivial result. And if you look, for example, at this online site, which has got some remarkable animations which are worth looking at, you will see uh, Geese develops this theme by using language which is very familiar to um, 
to number theorists, things like lattices in, in, the, in complex space, things called Eisenstein series, which are examples of modular forms, and Weierstrass elliptic functions. And you very quickly find yourself improving this result of the equivalence between what are called modular knots and Lorentz knots. You're in the territory that of Andrew Wiles in his proof of Fermat's last theorem. Wiles proved Fermat's last theorem by showing an equivalence between elliptic curves and modular forms. The whole apparatus that, Loren that uh, Wiles used to prove this theorem is the apparatus you need to prove this result. The reason I'm telling you this is that here's a remarkable connection to one of the deepest problems of, of mathematics from the, for several centuries, Fermat's last theorem. A connection that you would never have gleaned by just looking at those differential equations. It's by looking at the geometry associated with those equations in state space that has led to this connection. Um, another interesting connection which you would never glean from looking at the equations themselves but you would by looking at the um, attractor uh, is the question of whether there's a way of deciding whether a point in state space belongs to that attractor or not. Um, and whilst there are many points in state space you can say don't belong to the attractor, there is no algorithm which will actually tell you whether a point belongs to the attractor or not. This was made rigorous in a book uh, by a group of, of eminent nonlinear dynamicists, which include the very famous Steve Smale. And the theorem basically says that halting sets must have integral Hausdorff dimension. Now these fractals have fractional Hausdorff dimension, that's why they're called fractals. Um, and what this result means is that this question like, can you, is there an algorithm for deciding whether a point lies on the attractor or not, um, is, is actually not decidable by algorithm. Now this is quite, this is strongly then linked to another classic mathematical theorem of the 20th century, the, uh, the Gödel incompleteness theorem and the related uh, Turing non-computability theorems. So in other words, there are theorems in mathematics we cannot prove uh, to be true. There are uh, propositions in computing theory that we cannot prove to be, which we cannot demonstrate by finite algorithms. In fact, one can go down the route of looking at some of the classical problems in, in computing theory which are known to be non-algorithmic and show that they can be uh, written in this uh, sort of fractal geometric form. So there's a very famous um, algorithm in, or there's a very, very famous problem in, in computing theory called the post-correspondence problem, which I don't have time to talk about, but I mean, it's one that a, a student of computing theory would probably learn in, in one of the courses. It turns out that's equivalent to asking not whether a point lies on one of these fractal attractors, but whether a line intersects a fractal attractor. And again, that's not solvable by algorithm. All right, so what I'm trying to do in this first bit of the talk is convince you that these structures, these mathematical structures which come out of these differential equations, are really, you know, they're not just uh, for gee whiz, um, you know, put, people put them on the front of books or, or conference posters or things to kind of lure people in because it's gee whiz fractals. These have some profound uh, mathematics, they're, they're linked to some very profound mathematics. So I'm claiming uh, that these, these are linked to the, the maths that Andrew Wiles used to prove Fermat's last theorem, they're linked to Gödel's incompleteness theorem and the Turing non-computability theorem. On the other hand, the differential equations themselves, I think Newton would have probably understood. Um, they're nothing terribly kind of complex, complicated to look at, just single first-order derivatives, um, but these non-linear functions, quadratic functions, occurring on the right-hand side. So in some sense, I see Lorentz, Ed Lorentz, as providing a kind of a gateway from the world of Newton, the classical world of Newton, to the very... Um, deep areas of, of 20th century maths. All right, so having, if you like, established that as the first point of the talk, what I want to do now is get really to the main part of the talk, which is to replace these three people, uh, by three, these three mathematicians, by three physicists. <coughs> 
So if there are deep links to mathematics that we hadn't previously, perhaps, I'm sure many of you pre previously hadn't uh, known about, are there some deep links to this type of geometry with some of the deep problems that these guys were interested in? Schrodinger, Heisenberg and, and Dirac. I've chosen those. There are others, obviously, one could, uh, could, have, could have written. Now, at one level, if you looked at these equations and said, OK, is there a link here to the Schrodinger equation or to the Heisenberg form of the Schrodinger equation or to Dirac's relativistic form of the Schrodinger equation, you'd have to think I was completely, you know, completely mad, completely nut off my head. But for one thing, the Schrodinger equation, the Heisenberg equation and the Dirac equation are all linear equations, whereas this, as I said, is manifestly a nonlinear equation. So, you know, superficially... It doesn't seem there's any connection whatsoever. And one often reads books, I mean, there are many books out on the market who say, uh, well, you know, superficially, maybe there is some link between the, the unpredictability of chaotic systems and the unpredictability of, of quantum measurement. But this can only be a superficial uh, similarity, so the claim goes, because chaos is profoundly nonlinear, whereas quantum theory is profoundly linear. What I want to argue is that if we start looking at these objects, then this argument, um, in fact, is not, doesn't hold water. Before I get to that, I, I want to just, um, just go through a few quotes. Um, uh, this from Stephen Hawking, I suppose one could say, is the standard model for quantum interpretation. Um, so we all know that when we measure atoms and particles and so on quantum mechanically, the outcomes of the measurements are, are in some sense, very unpredictable and quantum mechanics only gives us uh, outcomes in some probabilistic form. So then the question is, are those probabilities because we just sort of don't know enough about the system? And the standard, um, the standard view, I think, was... was uh, um, was uh, put forward in, in one of uh, Stephen Hawking's books. Um, according to quantum physics, no matter how much information we obtain or how powerful our computing abilities, the outcomes of physical processes cannot be predicted with certainty because they're not determined with certainty. So that's, if you like, the standard view. There is no determinism in quantum physics. If we go back to some of the founding fathers, however, uh, things are much, much more equivocal. So here from uh, Dirac himself. Um, I must say that, like Einstein and Schrodinger, I also do not like indeterminism. I have to accept it because it is certainly the best that we can do with our present knowledge. And then he says, one can always hope that there will be future developments which will lead to a drastically different theory from the present quantum mechanical theory and for which there may be a partial return of uh, determinism. Well, the third, so I've mentioned Lorenz and Gödel. Uh, the third of my protagonists is Roger Penrose, who will appear uh, from time to time in this uh, lecture. But I just want to start with a quote from him, uh, where he, in some sense, you could say he's picking up on this, uh, this notion of a partial return of determinism. This is from one of his books. It seems to me to be quite plausible that the correct theory of quantum gravity might be a deterministic but non-computable theory. Now, this is interesting because, as I mentioned, if we think about the geometric properties of the strange attractor of Lorentz-type equations, and by the way, we now know that chaos is a very generic property of classes of differential equations. There's nothing very special about the Lorentz equations. Um, those those ge geometries are, have non-computable properties. So this is intriguing. Is there any connection? Is this just um, a coincidence? Or is there some connection here between some of the ideas Roger is trying to put forward? All right, I'll leave that hanging in the air, if you like, for the time being. Um, just in passing, I chose those particular people to get quotes from, uh, not only because they're eminent and interesting people, but they all, all have links to uh, Dennis Sharma. So here's Dennis. Um, Stephen, I think as Stefano said, Stephen was one of uh, Dennis's many um, uh, eminent students. 
Dennis himself was a student, one of the few students of Dirac. Uh, so there's a straight lineage now between uh, Stephen and, uh, and Dirac. And Roger Penrose uh, is somebody who started out his career as a pure mathematician. And really, it was only through, uh, uh, through engagement with, with Dennis when they were both at Cambridge that Roger actually moved from pure mathematics into general relativity theory and made the enormous impact he has made uh, in general relativity theory. So, in some sense, um, Dennis is very much the reason for, uh, for Roger Penrose being the uh, eminent mathematical physicist that he is. Um, as, uh, as, uh, as Stefano said, uh, Dennis had many uh, very eminent uh, uh, students. Um, he had a few, maybe not quite so eminent students. Um, but um, I have to say, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it, the, you know, my academic genealogy is so amazingly good that I, I find it difficult not to use this opportunity to, to tell people that uh, my academic brother is, oh, my academic brother is Stephen Hawking, oh, my academic grandfather is Paul Dirac, and my academic uncle is Roger Penrose. So, um, you know, my apologies for being slightly presumptuous, but it was too, too good to be true not to have this, uh, this slide up. Um, but anyway, so those quotes uh, from the three, three I gave, Hawking, Dirac, Penrose, um, are all in some sense uh, not only because they are eminent people, but they link very strongly to Dennis. All right, so I want to go back to this question about, you know, are we completely mad to try to ever think that something which is profoundly non-linear could have anything to say about um, the Schrodinger equation or, or Dirac form of the Schrodinger equation, if you like, which is linear. Right. So here's a slide I use quite a lot uh, in lectures about weather or climate. Uh, what it shows is uncertainty propagating on the Lorentz attractor. So you can imagine uh, you don't know, uh, you don't, I mean, a bit like the jiggling of my, of my laser point here, you don't know exactly where the true state is at some initial time, but let's say there's a 90% probability it lies within that ring. Now we want to know how that uncertainty, the fact that I'm not certain about the initial state, propagates in time. And it's an interesting fact of the matter that the uncertainty uh, evolves differently depending on where you start on the attractor. So in fact, even though um, you know, this is a chaotic system, it has sensitive dependence on initial conditions, um, not knowing exactly where the initial state is at initial time hardly makes any difference to knowing where you will be, let's say, after whatever you want to call this, some forecast period. The, the, the uncertainty is, is uh, if anything, shrunk rather than grown. So this is not at all characteristic of a, of a chaotic system. On the other hand, if you start a little bit lower down, then the uncertainty does start to grow. The actual, in fact, what happens is if this was a, a ball, the ball, the volume of the ball would start to shrink, but it would also sort of stretch out like a, like a banana. And in this case, uh, the uncertainty kind of explodes. So the point is... Uh, predictability will vary. This is a consequence of the, um, of the non-linearity of these Lorentz equations. So if, if, this is, if this is a shorthand form of the Lorentz equations, I can look at the growth of small perturbations by linearizing the equation, and if f is quadratic in x, then the, this Jacobian operator, as it's called, is linear in x, at least linear in x. So it depends on x. So the fact that the growth depends on where you are on the attractor is a, is a, is a, is a consequence of the non-linearity of the equations. However, you can ask yourself, what, what equation is this evolution of probability describing uh, in these three cases? And the answer is it's describing um, something called the Liouville equation, which I've written in the most general form here. Um, this looks a little bit like the mass continuity equation in an ordinary Newtonian fluid in physical space. But this is a, continu this is a sort of continuity equation for probability in the state space of the dynamical system. And it basically it says that probability is conserved 
as you move with the, with the flow in state space. So Liouville's theorem says if there's a 90% probability that the true state lies in here at initial time, there's a 90% probability that the true state lies in this ring at the forecast time. Now this is a linear equation, and just because it's linear, that says nothing at all about the non-linearity of the, of the di deterministic dynamics which underpins this equation, the deterministic dynamics which produces, if you like, these probability distributions. The linearity is just a consequence of the fact that probabilities are conserved. So if, I, if all I ever gave you was this equation for the Lorentz system, you couldn't deduce from that that the Lorentz system wasn't non-linear is not uh, If you know about these things, you can write for a Hamiltonian, uh, a kind of energy conserving Hamiltonian system, the Louisville equation in this form, which is probably familiar to lots of people. Um, so again, this is a probability function, this is the Hamiltonian, and this is an anti-symmetric uh, bracket called the Poisson bracket. And the reason I'm writing it like that is that it's very similar structurally to the form of the Schrodinger equation that uh, I think Dirac himself was probably the first to propose um, where again you have an equation for the rate of change of some let's call it probability function and some anti-symmetric um, quantity which involves a Hamiltonian probability now there are differences I'll come to these differences in a minute but and I think I'm sure this was what was underpinning Dirac's uh, uh, um, the quote I gave of Dirac earlier on that just as the fact this is linear doesn't mean there might be some underpinning deterministic dynamics which could be non-linear so too given this close similarity between these equations um, couldn't there be some underpinning deterministic dynamics uh, for which this equation is, is, the, is, the, is the Louisville equation. Now, it sort of depends now whether you are, what's, I don't know if this translates into Italian, but a, a, a glass half empty person or a glass half full person. If you're a glass half full person, you see the, the strong similarities between the Schrodinger equation and the Hamiltonian uh, and the classical ha uh, Louisville equation. If your glass half empty, you might say, ah, oh, but look, there are differences. This has got a square root of minus one. This has got this Planck's constant. And these aren't functions at all. They're operators in some Hilbert space. And this is an operator commutator, not a Poisson bracket. So there are differences. So the question is, are these differences important or not? Well, we understand over the years that they are important. These are non-trivial differences. The square root of minus one, Planck's constant, that Hilbert space they are important. And perhaps that difference is encapsulated in uh, the very famous Bell theorem, one of a whole family, if you like, of quantum, no, so-called quantum no-go theorems, which say that um, if you wanted to postulate um, a, a kind of an underpinning deterministic dynamic uh, that satisfied the sort of sensible relativistic ideas of causality and so on uh, you will never, a, never be able to re replicate all of the predictions of quantum mechanics so Dirac's hope that there might be some partial return to determinism seems to be uh, scuppered on the rocks of Bell's theorem uh, unless you want to admit some highly uh, what, what Einstein would call spooky action at a distance some, um, something which doesn't really seem to chime well uh, reside well with the principles of, of relativity. Um, for those who don't know, Bell's theorem is based on inequality to do with entangled particle pairs, looking at correlations, which I don't prescribe, I don't propose to describe uh, in, in, in much detail. I'll say a little bit about it in, in a few minutes, but I don't propose to say much about it. Are there any loopholes? I mean, when one has a theorem, people often then look for loopholes. Maybe there are some assumptions in the Bell theorem which aren't correct. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about one such loophole, not because I believe it, but because it's important for what I want to say later on. Um, so here's a quote from Bell himself, from John Bell himself. There is a way to escape the inference of superluminal speeds and spooky action at a distance 
but it involves absolute determinism in the universe. This might seem at first sight a little bit surprising. You might think, well, you know, maybe, maybe to kind of make contact with reality we need to relax this notion of determinism and admit a bit of stochasticity or something like that. But actually Bell's remark uh, is, is the opposite. We want to, if we want to escape these inferences of, of spooky action at a distance, we need absolute, what he calls absolute determinism. Something which now people, I think, tend to call super determinism. So as I say, I want to just spend a few minutes talking about this concept of super-determinism and, uh, and see where it leads us. Um, at least this is my understanding of the concept of super-determinism. Um, in ordinary, what I would call ordinary determinism, we have an equation, like the Lorentz equation, for example. Um, to make a trajectory in state space, we have to initialize the trajectory, so we have to start with some initial condition, and then the equations map you forward in time. Once you specify the initial condition, everything then becomes determined. The equations determine that trajectory. But in the standard sort of framework of thinking about these things, it's up to you to decide where you want, what you want those initial conditions to be. Nobody's telling you you have to choose these initial conditions rather than those initial conditions. You have a free choice, choose any condition, initial condition you like, and the whole of the three-dimensional Euclidean state space of the Lorentz equations. Once you've made that choice, then the future is determined. So standard sort of determinism has got this sort of uh, dichotomy between a free choice for your initial condition but a fixed dynamics. So the future state is, is sort of partly determined but partly free. The concept of superdeterminism is that for some reason, who knows what, the initial state is determined as well. There's some extra ingredient somehow which fixes the initial state. Then everything is absolutely uh, fixed. Um, now why does this get round the Bell theorem? Um, it gets round it in a rather trivial way, I have to say. In the Bell theorem, when you postulate what's called a hidden variable model, so you imagine you have a particle, an electron or something, and you you um, imagine that particle has got some extra properties, extra variables associated with it that you maybe don't know and quantum mechanics doesn't know. But nevertheless, those, those, those extra variables determine the outcome of some measurement. Now, the point about standard hidden variable models is that um, the hidden variable model will determine the measurements that you actually do in the, in, the, in the laboratory. But they also determine experiments that you didn't do, but you might have done. So you do an experiment, you want to measure the, the spin of an electron, uh, you decide, okay, I'm going to measure the spin of that electron, uh, let's say, in the up, in the z direction. And a hidden variable model would, would in principle, say, well, that was determined, you know, given, given that z direction, uh, the outcome is determined by the hidden variable model. But the hidden variable model would also have told you if I had, even though I actually measured in the z direction, if I sort of hypothetically had chosen, let's say retrospectively I asked, well, what would, it, what would have happened had I had chosen the x direction instead of the z direction? The hidden variable model is there on, on hand to be able to allow you to calculate that hypothetical or what a philosopher would call counterfactual direction. Okay. So this is a direction that didn't actually happen, but sort of in your head you could have imagined it might have happened. Now, if your hidden variable model is of that sort, um, it, 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 will, it, will, um, it will satisfy the Bell inequalities which, um, which are violated uh, in, in reality. And that's why um, the standard hidden variable models are not consistent with quantum mechanics. But if you somehow have a means of rejecting these counterfactual directions, you say, well, yeah, but, but actually there was only one initial condition that was possible. So these hypothetical worlds where, although I actually did it in this direction, I could have done it in that direction, then sort of become kind of then, you know, they're not part of your theory. So that's, that's, that's the argument. Um, if you can eliminate the counterfactual directions, then you have in principle a deterministic system which, will, uh, which won't be constrained by Bell inequalities. 
Now, Bell himself, so it's kind of a fairly trivial way in, in some sense in which the Bell inequalities you can get round the Bell theorem. Bell himself, and I think pretty much every physicist who works in this area, reject that argument. And the reason they reject it is that it seems to require a world that's just improbably fine-tuned. So, for example, you know, um, if, I, if I decide I'm going to roll a dice, and depending on the outcome of that dice, that will determine the orientation of my measuring apparatus, then, okay, you can say, well, maybe there is some harmony in the world which, which kind of correlates what the role of the dice and the setting of the... Um, it's all kind of predetermined the, 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 the state of the electron was in harmony with the fact that uh, with the role of the dice. But then you could imagine a world, you might say, well, suppose just some cosmic ray entered my brain and fired a synapse or something which maybe sli slightly jerked my hand as I rolled the dice and instead of getting a five, I got a six. Then that just that single cosmic ray would have broken this harmony, this supposed harmony between the, the, the hidden variable state of the electron and the and the, and the structure of the rest of the universe which determined the, measure, the, the orientation of the measuring apparatus. In other words, all right, you might specify okay, some, some very special uh, initial condition where the Bell inequalities are violated, which is what you want to be consistent with the experiment. But the argument goes that is just implausible because even the most infinitesimal perturbation would, to the Big Bang, some sort of hypothetical Big Bang prime, which was just infinitesimally different to the Big Bang, would kind of just destroy, as those perturbations grow, the butterflies, if you like, from the initial, from the Big Bang grew into changing things macroscopically. That will lead to a world where the Bell inequalities would be satisfied, and that is inconsistent. So then you've got to say, well, why, why Big Bang and why not Big Bang prime? What's special about the Big Bang? And then you might, you know, the only way around that is to say, well, maybe God made the Big Bang as it, exactly as it was and disallowed any Big Bang primes. But, you know, as physicists, we don't like to invoke some external agent to explain our theories of the universe, like God and so on. So um, this is all a little bit unsatisfactory. So, and this is often called the conspiracy theory. The super-deterministic world is just, to, everything seems to have to conspire unnaturally to correlate everything in the right way. And it just seems totally unstable to tiny perturbations. Yeah, and so, so the conclusion is you either believe there is no sort of sense of, of, of objective reality in the world associated with quantum mechanics, or if there is, it seems to violate principles of relativity theory. It has the Fuchs action of distance. And what I want to do is just propose some alternative ideas, coming back to the idea of fractal determinism. So here's the simplest of all fractals. This underpins Lorentz. It underpins every nonlinear dynamical system which has a, a fractal. It's a thing called the Cantor set. And the Cantor set can be generated by a series of iterations. So start with a real line. I've just drawn this sort of uh, vertically. But the real line between 0 and 1 and get rid of the middle third. So the 0th iteration is the whole real line. The first order iteration, I've got rid of the middle third. Um, the second order iteration, I've got rid of the middle third of those two bits. And the next order iteration, I get rid of the middle third of each of the bits. And I carry on and carry on and carry on. And mathematically, I take the intersection of all these iterates. And that's the definition of the Cantor set. What I want to do is imagine a dynamical system uh, which evolves on one of these fractal invariant sets. And I want to consider these types of perturbations. I want to consider perturbations to, to, um, to, the, to, these, uh, to these trajectories. Um, one, of, yeah, one of the beautiful properties of, of fractals is they link... I, I already mentioned the link to Fermat's last theorem, i.e. to number theory. Here's, a, here's an even simpler link to number theory. You can represent points on a Cantor set by numbers whose expansion in base 3 has only the digit 0 and 2. Essentially, this idea of removing every middle third is, sort of, is equivalent to removing all the numbers from the a real line which have a 1 somewhere in their base 3 expansion. So a point on the Cantor set, its base 3 expansion will just contain zeros and 2s. 
I'm going to perturb that point. I want to consider a perturbation to that, to that point on the Cantor set. I suppose I didn't know anything about the structure of the Cantor set, so I have a point on the Cantor set, and I just want to consider an arbitrary perturbation on, in the real line. An arbitrary perturbation on the real line will, by definition, have somewhere in it the digit 1. There'll be some digits 1, if it's a generic perturbation on the real line. So when I add it to this point on the Cantor set, I'm going to take myself off the Cantor set. Like that. Um, and this is, uh, this is to be considered gen a generic perturbation. So any, it seems like any tiny perturbation will take you off the Cantor set. And that's consistent with the Cantor set having zero volume. It's, it's, we call me measure zero. It has zero measure uh, relative to the, m the full measure of the real line. So when you look at it from the outside, when you just you have no kind of cognizance of the Cantor set, you're just considering perturbations to points on the Cantor set. The Cantor set just looks incredibly special and fine-tuned. But now I want to do this in a slightly different way. I want to consider perturbations which constrain me to the Cantor set. So again, here's a point on the Cantor set, and here's a perturbation which I'm going to call geometrically constrained. It's a perturbation that when I add it to the, um, to the Cantor set, keeps me on the Cantor set. Now you might say these, these geometric, geometrically constrained perturbations are you know, a very small subset of the, 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 the first lot of perturbations, which were just random perturbations on the real line. But one of the extraordinary properties of the Cantor set, and something which Cantor's colleagues at the time kind of chastised him for this because they thought he was being completely crazy proposing this. One of the remarkable properties of the Cantor set is there are just as many points on the Cantor set as there are on the real line itself. And a very simple way to see that is again to use number theory. Take any point on the real line between, um, between 0 and 1 and write that point, write its binary expansion at that point. So every point on the real line, say between 0 and 1, has a binary expansion where uh, the first is 0 point something or other, 0 point, 0 1, 0 1, etc. Now, replace every occurrence of the digit 1 with the, with the number 2. So now you have a, 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 a decimal, or not decimal, but a, an expansion which has just zeros and twos. Now, by definition, that is a point on the Cantor set. Remember I said the Cantor set is the set of all numbers which in base 3 just have zeros and twos. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between points on the Cantor set, or points on the real line and points on the Cantor set. So even though the Cantor set has um, zero measure in this big sp space in which it's embedded, it actually has a non-denumerably infinite uh, cardinality, the same as the real line itself. So actually there are just as many of these geometrically constrained perturbations as there are uh, geometri un geometrically unconstrained perturbations. In other words, if you were to look in the world, if you were just kind of constrained to this Cantor set world, you weren't cognizant of the embedding space in which it's, it's lying, the Cantor set actually looks an enormous place. It's not at all special or fine-tuned. It's an enormously big space. Um, this is a bit of a fuzzy picture. I don't know whether this, this translates uh, in this international audience, but on the BBC, um, we have a, a science fiction programme called Doctor Who. Um, it's, I think, it, I now, I believe it has the record, it's the longest running uh, science TV, science fiction series anywhere in the world. And um, it first came on to the air when I was a, a young kid. I forget, probably early 60s or late, John, you'll know, late 50s, early 60s, any, anyway, whatever. Um, in the days when policemen didn't have mobile phones or anything and they had to go to these telephone boxes, you know, if they needed to call up their colleagues to, you know, come and uh, sort of, you know, arrest a few burglars and things, they would have to rush to a, a, a police box. So this thing is a telephone box um, and, it, and uh, the idea is, uh, well, it just looks like a telephone box. But as soon as you go inside it, it's this fantastic time machine and it's an enormous place. It's palatial, it's got bedrooms and all sorts of stuff, you know, uh, much bigger than, than you would ever think to look from the outside. So here's this thing hurtling through space to some distant galaxy. Um, the point is, uh, 
It looks small from the outside, but actually it's enormously big from the inside. Well, that's science fiction, of course, but I, I, I see this as very much embodying this concept of the Cantor set, very sort of seemingly special from the outside, but actually very big and roomy from the inside. Um, we can do the same thing with the Lorentz system. Um, ask what sort of perturbations keep you on the Lorentz attractor. So there's a whole non-denumerable infinity of perturbations which keep you on the Lorentz attractor, which just move you from one trajectory to another. But one that wouldn't, uh, one that would take you off the Lorentz attractor is something that, say, keeps one of the uh, components of the state vector fixed, but perturbs the others. Now, I just want to make some connection now to, to physics, because just imagine this was a toy universe, and this was your hidden variable, um, and these were... Um, let's say, to do with how you orientate your measuring apparatus. And let's suppose the dynamics of your system was constrained to this invariant, what I call invariant set, the, 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 the attractor. Then this hypothetical perturbation that you might consider to your system, where you keep fixed the hidden variable, but change the orientation of your measuring system, this now becomes... Uh, one of these geometrically unconstrained perturbations. It's something which would not be consistent with the underlying dynamics. So you can imagine the, the perturbation in your head, but it doesn't translate into anything physically um, sensible in this picture. So this is something which I, as I say, in, my, in between doing my climate work, I, I feel quite strongly about, that, that this notion of fractal determinism provides a conspiracy-free loophole for the Bell theorem providing we can think of the universe as a whole as a dynamical system which, invol which evolves on some measure zero invariant set. It's a, it's like, if it can be likened to one of these dynamical systems which has a, a strange attractor, then we have a conspiracy-free loophole for the Bell theorem and a way to reinstate the notion of determinism uh, into, into quantum mechanics. This is something I, I published a couple of years ago now in, in the uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society. So it, it, it has, I hope, some uh, credibility. So the idea is that um, providing you thinking about these very plentiful perturbations on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the attractor, then in fact um, this is structurally stable. You can perturb away and not, uh, and not, and, and the Bell inequalities would be violated. So, in this picture, there's no need for God and Bell's implausibility. Like all the best, I watched the other day a conspiracy theory about Marilyn Monroe. Uh, was she, you know, murdered by JFK or Bobby Kennedy? Conspiracy theory. And of course, you know, once you look carefully at the information, it's all in, it's all in the mind. Those, these aren't real. Um, and Bell's implausible conspiracy uh, when I say it's all in the mind, what I mean is the types of perturbations that one considers, keeping the hidden variables fixed and perturbing the measuring apparatus, uh, is something which is geometrically unconstrained. It's not a, I would claim it's not a physically sensible type of perturbation. You can think in your head of many things which aren't physically sensible, pigs flying and stuff like that. But, so, I'm conscious of time and I've taken longer than I probably should have to, um, to, so I have to make a strategic decision. Um, what I'm going to do here is pass over a couple of slides, um, but what I, want to, um, what I want to try to... So I haven't really answered the question, where does Planck's constant, where does the square root of minus one, and where does the Hilbert space... Uh, which, by the way, leads to Schrodinger's cat being alive and dead at the same time. Uh, how does one fit those ideas into this notion of fractal determinism? I think all I'm going to say at this stage is that if you're interested in that, I have a paper on the archive which goes into this at quite a technical level. Um, I'm just going to say in passing that what, what, I'm, what I try to do, basically what I try to do is actually construct um, an invariant set um, in the state space of the universe from which quantum mechanical statistics including things like entanglement statistics emerge naturally. Um, Planck's constant in my view arises 
from thinking about uh, the effects of gravity. Um, uh, I think I'm conscious of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over this. I, maybe if people, I'll be here tomorrow, so if anyone's interested in talking about this some more, I, I'm happy to do that. So um, gravi gravity ter turns out to be a, cr a crucial factor in linking um, uh, the, the appearance of, quanta of, of Planck's constant. And I'm making here use of work by Penrose and Piozzi and others, Percival, in this area. Um, this is a technical slide, but I just want to say that just as in the Lorentz group, uh, sorry, in the Lorentz model, you can find the periodic orbits of the Lorentz equations by just taking, by looking at the modular group. So my claim is that one can, uh, there's a, uh, one can look at the so-called quaternionic group as a way of, of finding the symbolic structures of what, I, of what I claim is the invariant set for the whole universe. And um, this has a, um, this has the right property that, the, the, again, I'm, this is some technical stuff which I'm going to pass over. So this has the right property and one can link these, uh, these, these uh, uh, what are called symbolic sequences to Hilbert space states. Um, I think I'll just, just very quickly point this one out. Um, in the standard quantum theory, which has superpositions, even potentially at macroscopic levels, um, everything is, is unitary. Um, people do postulate adding collapse models, so explicit collapse models, which take superposed states to some very definite state um, in, uh, during, during collapse. Uh, again, Roger Penrose has, has, uh, has proposed some of these in the context of a gravitational collapse model. Um, in this case, you actually break unitarity during the, during the measurement process. Um, however, this type of model supports this notion of counterfactual uh, worlds through unita the unitary transformation, described transformation to the counterfactual worlds. In the theory I'm proposing, um, one still has a unitary time evolution of the, on, the, on the invariant set. It's the transformation to counterfactual worlds off the invariant set where unitarity would break down. So, just in conclusion, um, I'm very much um, uh, of the view that there is more to be learnt about the role of determinism in quantum theory. So, I very much support, you know, the Dirac and, and Penrose line. Um, I think the thing that maybe can help unify these whole areas, and in fact, my three protagonists, is this remarkable type of geometry which exists for certain nonlinear systems. Um, and in particular, then, this, this can help unify these three great revolutions of 20th century physics, uh, quantum mechanics, relativity theory, and chaos theory. Um, perhaps if one could boil this all down into a single statement, I believe that the laws of physics will have their most primitive expression in terms of state-space geometry. So GR has taught us to think about geometry in space-time. What I think we have to do is now extend that into uh, state-space itself. Um, just one, one final minute, just to finish with a very controversial um, statement, because um, in a sense this comes back to my, you know, my, my student days and thinking about the problem of quantum gravity. Um, this, this very much leads me to thinking that um, if this idea is right, then that quantum mechanics is emerging as a is, is an emergent property of a deeper deterministic system, where, as I say the laws of physics are, are, are determined by geometry in, in, uh, in state space and space time. Um, if that's true, then the whole kind of quantum gravity program as it's normally envisaged is a little bit misguided because the normal quantum gravity is very much puts quant the quantum field theoretic axioms as primitive and tries to find some either GR or some modification of GR which can somehow uh, sit well with those quantum field theoretic axioms. If one takes the view that quantum mechanics and by implication quantum field theory might be emergent in some more statistical way from a deeper theory of gravity which is geometric both in space-time and in state space, then the whole uh, rationale for quantum gravity as it's whether we're talking about string theory or loop quantum gravity or any other version thereof becomes in my view uh, questionable at, at its foundational level. So I liken it a little bit to um, 
the, the standard quantum gravity is a bit like you know, putting the, the cart before the horse. Uh, in my view, the horse is the thing, the gravity is the thing that drives quantum mechanics rather than the other way around. Um, so if I had to make a prediction, uh, I would say that we will never find such a thing as a graviton. Um, I, I dare say this will not be... Um, this is not something we're going to find in the near future, so it's a rather distant prediction, but um, that's my opinion. All right, so I'm just going to finish now by um, just returning to Dennis. Um, I mean, Dennis, as I said, was a... Um, uh, an, I mean, apart from being a great uh, scientist in his own right, was an enormously inspirational um, mentor. Um, I think anyone who uh, went to one of Dennis's lectures would, could have failed uh, you know, not to be utterly uh, captivated by uh, his, his, his excitement and his, uh, his real passion for, for science. And so um, I think one, one thing I want to just leave you with is that although I did indeed move into uh, many quite different areas of science to, to that which Dennis uh, worked primarily, um, I think it's fair to say that an education under Dennis Sharma is, is not something uh, one can readily um, shake off. Um, and in my case, I'm very happy that I haven't been able to shake it off. Uh, and it's allowed me to uh, continue to think about some of these deep problems as well as being able to hopefully make some contribution to important societal problems, which climate certainly is. So, thank you very much. Well, we have time for a few questions, if uh, any. So, going back to the linearity of the, <coughs> the Schrodinger equations and non-linearity of the Lorentz equations, it is true that the Schrodinger equations are linear and somehow you wouldn't expect the evolution to be, as you said, uh, to be or stochastic, but uh, as, well, as far as I understand, the uncertainty of quantum mechanics occurs when you try to measure something, after you, me you try to measure something. So, in your research, maybe have you tried to make any connections between the not very well understood uh, measurement structure and the chaos? I'm uncertain. <coughs> Yeah, um, I very much take, I very much support the line that Roger Penrose and, and others, I don't think he's unique in this aspect, is that um, during the measurement process, um, and, and in, yeah, during the measurement process, and in particular as you evolve towards macroscopically distinguishable states, um, the effects of gravity can no longer be ignored. Um, that equation which I didn't have time to talk about which related a kind of gravitational interaction energy with Planck's constant is a, is a kind of measure of that and it basically says that you know for example if you imagine particles going through a stern gerlach apparatus you know one particle maybe gets deflected down one particle gets deflected up uh, at that level the effects of gravity are utterly irrelevant so the the energy it would take to move a particle in the lower beam you know, to the position of a particle in the upper beam is, is just utterly irrelevant. And that's saying that this gravitational interaction energy, it's integral at least in, over time, is much smaller than Planck's constant. But what, um, what Penrose, Diossi, Kibble, Percival, many people have claimed is that once the particle enters a measuring apparatus and you start to disturb large numbers of atoms and so on. And, and in fact, you know, pointers become macroscopically d different, uh, so up and down. Then this measure of gravitational interaction energy can no longer be said to be less than Planck's constant. There's enough of a gravitational effect. And what I'd use in my uh, picture is this criterion um, for giving different, uh, distinct labels to space-times. So a space-time trajectory where a particle will be deflected to the lower beam, in the lower beam, and then set off a 
macroscopic effect would be given a different symbolic label to one where it goes into the upper beam. Um, where, I, where I take, where I, where I depart from Roger and, and others is that I don't think the right way to, to, uh, to um, add the, this gravitational effect is actually through the Schrodinger equation. So typically what people like him would do would imagine, well, the unitary evolution uh, uh, is no longer, um, no longer operates when you start to get into measurement. So in other words, they're adding terms, effectively, or imagining terms, adding to the Schrodinger equation, which destroy unitarity. I think that is the wrong way to go about it. I think, um, the, as I say, if you take classical physics as, as, a, as an illustration, you wouldn't, you'd never want to touch that. Just because I had a look, like in the Lorentz model, I had a non-linear system, it doesn't make me want to add non-linear terms to the Louisville equation. It's the wrong way to go about it. So, all I can say is I share the Penrose et al. view that gravity becomes an important physical process during measurement. However, where I take, where I depart is from uh, adding that as a term in the, in the in, in, the, in, this, in the Schrodinger equation. That's the wrong way to go about it. Any other question? Curiosity, you said uh, you bet there are no gravitons. What about uh, classic gravitational waves as the geometrical objects? Oh, no, no. no, I have no problem with that. And I, that's what I actually I worked on in my, <laughs> for my PhD. And... Uh, you know, the question of how do you quantify the energy momentum of such a, a, a quantity. What's uh, your opinion on the energy momentum carried by gravitational waves? Um, what I did was to um, come up with a um, uh, so I believe it is possible to, to quantify them, but not using uh, the, the Actually, this doesn't, this doesn't, this links a little bit to what I'm saying because the way I claim you can formulate a perfectly covariant um, uh, expression for gravitational energy and momentum is not to use tensor fields on space-time, which is the normal way we do GR, but actually to define it as in terms of tensor fields on the tangent bundle to space-time. Now, the interesting thing, I'm thinking back now 30 years, so this is slightly... <laughs> if I can still remember it. The thing about these uh, ten uh, tensors on tangent bundles is they, they map um, down uh, in, a, in a sort of in a quasi-local way into space-time. Um, if you want to, yeah, so if you want to if you want if you want to be able to describe the information um, in a tensor field on the tangent bundle to space-time you, you have to specify um, quantities at more than one point in space-time itself. So the isomorphism, if you like, is between, um, between the tensor fields on the tangent bundle and um, tensor fields over multiple points of space-time. So it becomes a, what I call quasi-local. It's perfectly geometric, but it's not, it's not localizable. Um, and when when um, when space-time has a killing field, a certain, property, a certain component of this gravitational energy and momentum would, would be conserved. Um, so it has all the right geometric properties, but it's, qua it's quasi-local, it's not, it's not local. Um, incidentally, I mean, this thinking about the, the tangent bundle to space-time is a little bit like thinking about state space. Um, it, it's a kind of a it's kind of set of all space-times with different, different ve vector fields. So it's kind of a little bit like, I mean, consistent with my statement that we should be thinking about the laws of physics in state space and about thinking about maybe laws of physics on these higher bundle fields. Well, any other question? If there are no other questions, I have one small question. Yeah. And the question is the following. In you're basically advancing this idea of an emergent quantum mechanics. Yes. Generally, emergence... Uh, 
Um, for example, there are similar concepts now in uh, emergence of space-time, and generally what you have or what you expect is that the typical symmetry associated to space-time are emergent, and you can look for deviation of, from this symmetry maybe in some particular regimes. So my question for you is the following. Um, the emergence of quantum mechanics you are uh, talking about uh, would or can be tested somehow. Can, is there any regime where you would expect that this would not m uh, be in agreement uh, with, uh, with standard, the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics? There is a corner where uh, you start to see them, the fact that it is an emergent concept. Maybe at the plant scale, I don't know, but is there a regime? Well, certainly, I mean, the, I mean the, the regime would certainly be at the level, I mean, as I say, if you could, if you could probe, if you had, a, if you had a, an LHC which was powerful enough to detect gravitons, my prediction is you get a null result. I mean, is there anything in standard quantum theory um, that... Um, uh, that may be where there's a difference, experimental difference between quantum theory and, and, and my kind of approach. Well, I would love that to be the case. Um, the only, maybe it's something we can talk about later. I mean, there's one area which, which, which kind of interests me a bit, which is that in quantum information theory, when you have um, entangled qubits, um, and the state space, the, the Hilbert space is some n-dimensional sphere um, and it turns out there's, a, there's a, a theorem in mathematics that's to do with things called hop vibrations that for l low dimensional spheres you can write the sphere as a, as a, tan as a about tangent bundle so you can write the sphere as a tangent bundle of, a, of a, one sphere over another sphere but that breaks down um, for I think once you get to four qubits, this, this hop vibration property breaks down and you can no longer write the state space of four entangled qubits as a, as, a, as a fiber bundle. Now, this is the only thing where I can find a possible link where, in my theory, irrespective of how many entangled qubits there are, there's also always a decomposition into these fiber bundles. Um, it's basically because I don't have a, a continuum field. It's a sort of it's a it's a it's a discretized type of structure. So there's always a way of doing this fiber bundle decomposition. So I have actually I'm in, in correspondence with some quantum information people as to whether there's a potential experiment one could do with mul you know four or more entangled qubits, which, which could possibly shed some daylight between predictions of quantum mechanics and my approach. But it's too early to to say whether anything will come of it. Okay, I think that uh, it's time to wrap up if there are no other questions. So I would say let's thanks again the speaker and good evening.